the uh, the rainy weekend and the gloom of the forecast for this coming weekend, I appreciate you coming out tonight. It's going to be a very valuable um, topic to consider and, and talk about, especially in light of a storm coming, because forests can really help us. <coughs> When we have terrible weather like this, and forests can help our day all the time. So, this is the second in our series of Mayo Matters. Some of you came last month when we talked about stormwater management, and I hope all of you will come next month when the Department of Public Works will address the Mayo septic system. And it's not a crisis, it's just an explanation of how the septic system works. Um, especially good for people who are new to the community. So, um, welcome again. Uh, where is Laura? Laura's right here. I'm going to turn the floor over to Laura, another member of the Neighbors of the Mayo Peninsula, and she will introduce our speaker. Hi, everybody. Hello. And, oh, right. I will second um, Emily's welcome. It's great to see the interest in um, a whole range of topics that affect the peninsula. But um, tonight we are very grateful that Craig Highfield made some time for us. Um, Craig is the director of the Chesapeake Forest Program for the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. And he's been doing that for about 10 years now. We were counting years because we came that way back um, when this was sort of getting launched. Um, tell you about the Chesapeake Forest Program and also about the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, who I also used to work for many years ago. Um, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay is a nonprofit organization that works to improve the health of um, the Chesapeake Bay region ecosystem, the bay, its rivers, its forests, and its communities. Um, it has been around since the 1980s, since the bay restoration effort got started, um, and it served a really important purpose. It came into being about the same time that the Bay Foundation did. The Bay Foundation, um, filled a niche of being much louder and more aggressive, which is a valid role to play at times. But the Alliance really worked to build partnerships, to fill gaps and broach conversations around topics and places that often got overlooked and weren't the highest profile. And because of that, they were really able to, um, to move conversations forward, especially in agriculture in the early days. So um, about 10 years ago, the Alliance got involved um, with looking at forest stewardship more closely because um, the trend in the area, and I don't know if you're gonna talk about this, Craig, is moving from owners, uh, people who own very large tracts of forests, often tied with family farms, into smaller and smaller parcels as those areas get subdivided, developed, there's um, large block homes, which often have, not, they might not think of them as forests, they call them woods, the woods in your backyard. <laughs> and they don't think too much about it because it came with the house. But in reality, all of these parcels work together and provide services to the community, and they can also provide benefits to their owners. But reaching those new, that new generation of forest owners through um, about <coughs> stewardship opportunities and about economic opportunities is much harder because there's a lot more of them now. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so some new approaches to outreach were needed, and that's where the Alliance has stepped in, and that's where Craig's program has blossomed over the last 10 years. So um, they are based in Annapolis as part of the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. They also have offices in Pennsylvania and in Virginia. And they work on reforestation pro uh, projects, also on um, tree plantings in you know, communities, urban areas. And they work with um, woodland ownership. Wood, I'm sorry, I'm saying that. Wood, owners of small woodlots and, and the stewardship and um, economic opportunities that are open to them, really trying to deliver the message that even when your woods are small, it, they're worth having for a lot of um, ecological reasons, and that you can get economic benefits for them, and not only maintain it as a healthy forest, but sometimes it helps maintain it in a healthy way. So um, thank you, Craig. I'll let you fill them in on the details. No, so I was taking notes on that about my own organization. Uh, no, but uh, we'll, if you didn't get this at the beginning, these are free, you know, I'm going to actually refer to a couple things in here if you don't have it. I don't even know, this is one beautiful guy, perfectly laid out. Is that too dark? Uh, Laura did this for us, actually designed it. So, but this is a really good book that we actually use for really all of our outreach events. It's a quick guide, a little bit about forest ownership. And there is a section in here called Your Woods and Your Wallet, and that's really where the 
this workshop came from, or this presentation, really focusing on the economics of it. But I'm actually going to do a little bit more today because I've, I've noticed people want to know more. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Maryland's woodlands, a little bit about ecology of the woods, uh, and then I'll kind of get into Maryland programs and down a little bit to the economics of it. So we're going to cover a little of everything. Uh, does anyone here own any woodlands? Well, what, what, what's your definition of woods and forest? Uh, that's acre, the, acre. If you have an acre tree, that's considered woods. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Well, I might fly through the second one, but we'll focus on this one. But I will refer to a couple things in here. So, Maryland's wood. So, I think, I'm not originally from Maryland, from northwest Pennsylvania, but there was a lot of forest. But Maryland's woodlands are remarkable compared to any other woodlands around it. Who's ever heard the term, Mar or Maryland is America in miniature? Who's ever heard of that? Because it's a small state, and there's a lot to offer. If you just think of the geography from, let's say, all the way down in Somerset County, and if you travel all the way out to Garrett County, think of how the landforms change. But the only way to think about that is think about how the forests change. So if you do have this book and you need a closer look at this, uh, right at the end on page 17. So if you're thinking about being all the way down here at Somerset, nice flat, you know, almost below sea level down there, very flat, wide open, very sandy soil. But as you start to make your way up the eastern shore, landforms start to change. Okay? But not only that, the forests start to change. So if you see these colors here, these are forest associations. So they're different types of forests. But you can see in Maryland, as you start to move all around the state, our forests change with those landforms. And there's a reason for that. We'll get into it. So it's remarkable. The forests out in Garrett County are drastically different than the ones down in Charles County. And the one in Charles County are drastically different than what's up in Hartford County. They're all different because Maryland is American miniature. It just offers so much variety. So that's why I think Maryland's forests are remarkable. And even really what you can find in our forest, in this small little state. Okay? And because Maryland, historically, is a forest. And naturally is a forest, mostly. Except when you get down to some of those marshlands on the eastern shore. They have been marsh for a long time. But Maryland is a forest. As a matter of fact, most of the east was a forest at one time. Long before humans ever came to... Uh, to this land, it was forest. That's the natural plant community that wants to be here. You don't believe me? Stop mowing your lawn, and eventually a forest is going to want to return. We have the right climate, we have the right soils for forests to be there. Okay? And the Chesapeake Bay loved that because even before humans were there, so the Chesapeake Bay itself is about uh, 10,000 years old. Okay, it's a very young bay. It used to be a flooded river, Susquehanna River, but it's a bay, so it's surrounded on three sides by land. But before humans were there, forests covered 95% of that watershed. Okay? Forests were there. Our bay is very, very unique compared to any other estuary in the world in the fact that half of the water in the Chesapeake right now is fresh water coming off the land. 50% of it is salt water coming in from the ocean to make the estuary. Most bays have a majority salt water coming in. And the reason I'm saying this is our bay is heavily influenced by the activities on the land. What's on the land? Because that rainwater coming off the land into the bay is coming from whatever's going on in the land. And for thousands and thousands of years, that was going through a forest. Okay? All that water is coming through the forest. If you think about those rockfish coming in here, there's a reason they were coming in here. But... The forest provided the right nutrients for, really, the whole plant system. So if you think about phytoplankton and zooplankton, that whole ecosystem to be created because of the nutrients coming off the land. A lot of bays, you go out there, they don't, they're not as rich uh, in those nutrients uh, as our Chesapeake is at one time. The oysters, there's a reason for that. The crabs, there's a reason for that. They were influenced by what was coming off the land. So... It's very interesting, in our forest, and this is kind of the, the bay's woes, I guess, right now. So if you think about, the problems in the bays is, I guess, the rain, okay? What happens to that rain when it hits the land? So rain can either do two things when it hits the land. It can either run off the surface, or it can sink down into the soils. In a forest, 
And this is just on average. In some places, it's more of this. Half of the water, when it's raining in a forest, sinks down into the groundwater. Because the forest soil, very porous, a lot of roots, organic matter, it's sinking down and becomes groundwater. Half of it either evaporates or is transpired through the trees. So it's released right back out into the atmosphere. Very small portion of it actually ever runs off. So if anyone was outside that last weekend, when we, this last weekend we had all that rain, or this weekend when we have all that rain, or every weekend when we have all this rain, um, you'll notice in a forest that water is sinking to the ground. Okay, when you start to change that is when you have that different thing. So like I said before, it's called watershed tea. It's kind of a, a funny term we use for it, but as that water comes in through the ground, it's moving. It doesn't just stay there, it moves to get to ground level. And we're kind of at that sea level really close here, but it's going to come out in our streams, in our rivers, and it's carrying with it those uh, minerals that are coming through that forest soil. So our bay is highly influenced by our forests or was for thousands of years. And like I said, with this groundwater, so it's moving at different paces. So you have that subsurface where it's sinking to the ground, it's moving within days, it comes into our streams and rivers. Some of it takes years to actually move through there. That's why our non-tidal streams and rivers are always flowing, because they're always having groundwater to actually fill it up as the, years, uh, as the days go by, if you don't have rain. Okay, I'm going to stop there because normally I then get into what happened to all the forest. But I want to kind of cover forest ecology because this is a fun topic. If you do have trees, if you can see forests around there, just talking about how they work. Because working with the forest instead of against the forest will make life a lot easier. So you're almost going to forget what you think you know. Who likes to be in the woods, whether you own them or not? Who feels a sense of a relief walking into the woods? Who feels... Like this woman right here. <laughs> she's so giddy that she's in the woods. <laughs> this guy, it's a little creepy up there, but he's pretty happy to be in the woods. So, who's ever heard the term uh, nature uh, in balance, the balance of nature? Okay. So, that's a concept thinking that nature's in balance, it'll take care of itself. Something happens, a tree's fall out of the tree, will be there, hold it up like this one. So if nature is in balance, if it's a thing of balance, that is a loving embrace. Okay, I'm gonna, this is my heartbreaking slide. I'm sorry to do this, but it's a way of understanding. It. That's not what's happening. There's really no such thing as balance of nature. I hate to break it to you, you can't go back if you're hearing this. It is a war. Those trees are not hugging, they're trying to kill each other. They are. This, Northern white oak is literally growing around this beach right now for space. They're coming in the same spots. They're trying to get up to that canopy. They're trying to dominate the light there. It's literally can't move it, so it's growing around it. You know, if you walk in after this hurricane or any kind of windstorm, what are the trees doing? They're swaying back and forth. The branches are smacking each other, and there's debris falling, leaves falling. They're literally clearing out space to get more light. You know, they're not doing that on purpose, but it is happening, and that's what's, uh, what happens in our thing. And the reason I say this is if nature, especially our forest, if it was a balanced thing, then we'd have catastrophes with th these events. Okay, I'll explain this. Anyone know what kind of tree that is? Probably in our mountains, probably one out of every four trees was this tree right here. Most valuable tree, humans, wild, most valuable tree, I would say, in the U.S. at one time. Yes, the chestnut. American chestnut. You find them in the Appalachians, you can find them on the Piedmont too, but they were extremely valuable for humans, for their food purposes, for building. I mean, that wood doesn't rot at all. Wildlife tree, one out of every four tree. What happened to our chestnut? Blight. Yeah, blight came in within a few decades, they're all gone. Yeah. So if you think about it, now, that would be catastrophic in our woods. If it was out of balance then, then our woods would have collapsed. Because you could say this was the dominant tree, but that didn't happen. Our woods responded to that. The oaks loved the fact, the hickory loved the fact that our chestnut were gone, because it gave them more room to grow. That's why we have a dominant oak hickory forest around here. That's the dominant forest type in all of the Chesapeake Bay watershed is the oak hickory forest. And one reason is because they were able to occupy a space left by the chestnut. They didn't care if the chestnut was there or not. They didn't know. Their life didn't depend on it. They actually increased more. So 
when you're thinking about the words, you think this is on my most depressing side, but I'll be bringing it up. But it's all about fecundity, which is just passing your genes on to the next generation. That's how kind of nature works. They're going to pass it on. So in order to do this, our critters, our plants, they have traits to allow them to be able to better adapt and, and be able to transfer their traits to the next generation. I'll go over a couple here. We'll go to this Killian woodpecker first. They have characteristics that help them succeed out here. So anyone know where they build their nest? Can they build their nest on, say, the edge of this forest here? No, they're actually called a fit. So forest and tower interior dwelling species. They need large blocks of woods in order to reproduce. Reason being is this little rascal up here. Uh, that is a brown-headed cowbird. Anyone ever heard of brown-headed cowbirds? Yeah, they're called nest parasites. The reason, this is how they're adapted to pass their genes on, and it's so selfish. They lay their eggs in some other bird's nest, and then they never see it. They don't take care of it, and they're like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go have some fun in this field. Uh, but that brown-headed cowbird, you see those eggs are different. It usually is a bigger uh, bird when it comes out. Uh, it comes out usually first. Sometimes we'll knock these eggs out of the nest. Usually dominates the mother's attention. The mother can't figure out it's not her young. She'll feed them first. So essentially, they're letting other birds rear them. So that's their thing. Uh, let's talk about different traits that help these things survive. Oak trees are pretty remarkable trees. This is how they're really able to dominate after the chestnut left, is Oaks take a long time to grow. They grow very slowly. If you walk in your forest right now and you see small oak trees, well, the chances are they need light in order to get big. So they'll grow so high, if there's no light, the top of it just dies off. But their roots stay alive. Okay, and they'll grow up again, and it dies off. They're waiting for light to happen. And so what happens is sometimes there's a blowdown. Uh, it could be a fire or something like that. They have large root systems that as soon as there's light, they take off. That's why our oaks are so dominant around here at that time, is because they are able to take advantage of that. Grapevine. There's another one where it doesn't have to worry about growing and being supportive. It lets another tree take it up to the camp. Anyone hey, we'll have a grapevine on their, on their trees? It's good for wildlife, but they can dominate everywhere. This could be a real problem, especially on windy days, uh, like we're going to have this weekend. Um, I'll go over this one. I'll keep moving on. Black walnut. Does anyone know anything about the black walnut and how they succeed? Yeah, this is a cool one, too. A lot of trees do this. They kill off other things. They're allelopathic, meaning they release a toxin, essentially, called juglone, into the soils, and it prevents other seeds from germinating around them. Which is kind of a cool thing. It took a long time for this to happen, but that's why you don't want to plant anything near your black walnuts. Uh, because they can dominate. That's kind of their thing. So, if you're thinking about that adaptation, so, let's get that down to think. Everything out there is competing against each other. In your forest, all those trees are competing. They don't love each other. They're competing to see who can be dominant so you can pass on more genes. And so what are they competing for? Well, if you're a gardener, it's the same thing any plant will compete for. They're competing for light, water, and soil nutrients. Now, your land, if you have land with a tree, it's providing that. It's providing essentially light or space. It's providing the soil and it's provi uh, uh, soil and the nutrients. Your land provides that in different amounts. Now, if all our land was flat, do you think of all Maryland flat, if it had the same soils, we would have three different trees in Maryland, essentially. Three dominant trees, that would be it. Because it would be those three that dominate in it. But luckily we don't. We have flat areas, uh, we have uh, hilly areas, we have mountains, we have all sorts of stuff that creates different growing conditions for our trees. Which is pretty wild to think about. Think about, let's say, the Alaskan husky. Anyone ever see these? I was in the last one. So they're pretty amazing dogs. They can pull a sled. They love going. They're out in really, really cold temperatures. They're adapted to do that, to live there, to do what they do. Can you imagine if you put like a greyhound in Alaska up there? What would happen? They're both dogs. What would happen? They could succeed up there. Now, if you took these guys down to Florida and put them on a track, could they succeed? No, our trees are the exact same way. Okay? They have special adaptations over thousands and thousands of years that give them dominance. 
Now, I'm going to say most trees out there are going to grow their best, their biggest, their fastest on well-drained, loamy soils. That's the, probably the ideal condition of every tree. If they had that, they would grow the biggest they can be. But unfortunately, we don't have that, and you only have a couple trees. But things like this, you guys are probably lucky to know what this is. Anyone know what this tree is? Cypress. Bald cypress. Anyone ever see the bald cypress swamps around yes. here? Yeah. There's a cool yeah. swamps there. Yeah, they, you know, they put out these knees. They live in muck. They live in something that nothing else can survive. I tell you what, they don't grow their best in the muck. They probably don't want to be in the muck. But they can outcompete any other tree in that area. So that's why when you go to these swamps, you're seeing these bald cypress. Because nothing else can live down there. And that's where they can pass their genes on. Uh, things like pitch pine. Lover pines can deal well really in dry mineral soils, where nothing else, hardwoods, can't really survive as well. That's why you see them there. They can dominate in that. Um, beach, they have a tolerance of shade. So a lot of our older forests, too, you can see beach coming up through in this area, uh, especially in the wintertime when all the leaves are off and you kind of see these gold leaves hanging on these saplings. That's all beach that's coming up. They can tolerate the shade, which is really cool. That's how they succeed. If you think we don't have this here, going out west, this is the most obvious thing. The trees that you see up here will be drastically different if you walk down the trail down here. Why do you suppose? What's different up here than down here? Soil. Yeah, soils are going to be different. Like there. Water. Water's going to be different. The moisture, so everything's running down that way. Our moist soils will be down here, so you'll see things like tulip poplar which loves that kind of that moist soil. Up here, you get a lot more of the oaks. On this side of the mountain, you'll see different trees than this side of the mountain. And it's kind of neat to see. If you do go out to the mountains, this is where it's kind of drastic. You could be walking over the valleys, and you can see one side to the other. You'll see drastically different trees. It's kind of cool. And this is the only graph. I just drew this in recently, but this is, this is I'm nerding up on this graph. You don't pay attention, but this is, kind of indicates why it's out. I pulled this out of a, an old forest ecology book. But if you think about it, if you take things like your soil, so this hydric means dry, mesic is moist, the best soils, and xeric is dry soils. If you take four trees that you can find around here, these are four trees that you might even find you know, within you know, 100 yards from here, white ash, tulip poplar, northern red oak, and Virginia pine. You see how they have their areas where they can dominate. So you can see in the mesic soil, tulip poplar, this is where you're going to find it. They have to have moist soil, but they'll dominate them. So if you go into an area where you see there's lots of tulip poplar, you know that soil is pretty good. It's a nice moist soil, loamy soil, because it's dominating there. But you can see just their wind, as soon as it starts to get too wet, down on the riparian area, you're not going to see them anymore. They drop out. And then things like white ash, green ash, river birch, you'll start to see more of those because they can dominate there. They're not competing with them. Or if you get into that drier area, You'll have your Virginia pines. That's why you see Virginia pines growing up a lot of farm fields, old abandoned farm fields. If you go into an area where it's nothing but Virginia pine, you can tell that was probably an old field that had grown up first. These are the first things that kind of occupy that. Okay, and now we'll, get, we'll kind of lead into that old, old field thing that I was talking about. Because this will kind of give you an idea of how the forests react. Now, at one point, we were down to you know, 20 some percent forest cover in the Bay Watershed from about 95 percent. Most of our forests that you see around here were farms. Most of your forests around here are between 80 and 120 years old. Okay, because, and I'll get into this probably in the next presentation too, they've grown back on abandoned farm fields. So we actually have really young forests compared to other places. Uh, most of them have grown back on just abandoned farm fields. But there's a way to get from this field to this. Understanding how a forest is changing can kind of give you an idea of what you can do with your forest, where you want it, and what it provides. It's called forest succession. It's just a predictable change in plant community over the years. And I have some pictures to, to demonstrate this. In the east, the biggest thing that they're competing for, the thing is limited supply is light. We have, enough soil, we have enough good soils, we have enough moisture in the soils that they do compete for it, but the big thing is actually light. When you walk into our forest and look up, see those trees. Those trees won the competition for light. They dominate. They got to the light quicker, they closed the canopy, everything below it. Either it tolerates the shade or it just dies off. 
So they're competing. And in a forest server, we use that. So the, there is a predictable amount of time. This is why I say between 80 and 120 years old, most of our forests, is there's a predictable time of what happens in your forest. If you just have an old field, you let it go, or let's say it's an old cornfield. You didn't put anything on it. This happens a lot. Uh, you have grasses and weeds, the first thing to occupy. Light-blown seeds, annuals. They just come and dominate it for a little bit. And then eventually you start to get some woody stems, uh, some blackberries. You might get some trees like sumac. They're all short-lived trees. They grow very fast, pass on their genes to the next generation. Uh, and then you start to get these uh, dominant trees. They're shade-intolerant trees, meaning that if you put shade over them, they won't survive. So they grow extremely fast. Things like black cherry, uh, yellow poplar. Um, a lot of our pines are shade intolerant. That's why they grow so fast. And then you have things that are just kind of hanging back, like your oaks that can tolerate, peach can tolerate a lot of shade, persimmons can tolerate. And actually, in this guidebook, we have all of that information in there. So I, I have all the information about shade tolerance and things like that. So let's just take a look. The, the, I got this. This is a typical, uh, this is from North Carolina. The old field succession. So at one time you have that, it's just bare field. First things are annual. So the grass is kind of dominant, just left to go. You start to see some forbs coming in. And then after a while, you start to see some of the woody trees coming in. So a lot of uh, red cedar is another early pioneer species. So if you're seeing red cedar out there, they don't live a long time because they grow up, dominate, they cannot tolerate any shade. Um, you can see more of the forbs. Brambles. Ah, then you can start to see the hardwoods coming in. See, they take a lot longer to grow. There's all the red cedar there. But you have hardwoods, which take a while to grow up. You can see they're starting to get bigger, starting to top the red cedar a little bit. You can see now they're getting bigger and topping things a lot. They're just as big. They're still competing for that light. It's very, very dense in there. How old would that be? Uh, this right here, I, I would say that that was probably... Uh, 15 to 20 years old. And then you can see the old remnants of that red cedar. See right there? It just got topped. And, and uh, as soon as it gets topped, it just dies off. And then, really, after about 50 years, you start to get some of those uh, understory plants that can sort of like your trillions and your orchids. Things that, really beautiful plants that are out there. We have a lot of orchids that are in our forest right now. It, they're you know, well, they'll start to develop, too, and they just kind of hang on the bottom. And you do have your understory trees, which tolerate the shade. So it's kind of how things move. Now, the thing is, when humans arrived here, if this forest succession thing was just exact, we'd only have those old forests that happen. It doesn't happen with our forests around here. Our forests are, are disturbed all the time. They're used to being disturbed. Things have always knocked our forests around, whether it's fire, storms, like we're going to have this weekend, floods, drought, insects, diseases. They've always been present to kind of knock succession back. Things grow up, they knock it back to the beginning. Uh, even human influences. So, example, this is actually Pennsylvania, just over the line in York County. Um, this was a harvest that was done. You could say that was a pretty major disturbance, right? 60 years later, that same place. Okay, trees grew back, so it's a disturbance. Trees want to come back. You, that's why I said if you, when you're mowing the lawn, all you're doing is preventing a forest from coming back. You're disturbing <laughs> the forest that wants to be growing up there. Uh, so when we do harvest, we're essentially pushing succession back. You're just taking those trees and you're moving them back to an early age. Um, it's just a young forest. If you clear cut a forest and leave it to grow, that's just a young forest coming back. Which is just a different state. Some animals need that. When you plant trees, you're essentially pushing succession forward. Okay, like if you have a lawn or if you have a pasture and you're planting trees in it, you're deciding what trees are do there and you're giving them a head start on that. So we plant a lot of trees, so we've got a lot of pushing forward on this. Um, it's kind of work. And these are the last pictures, that, and I'll kind of show you. Speaking of a harvest, this is uh, I show this with every presentation, no matter what. Even if I'm not talking about forests, I'll show. This is uh, up in uh, Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania. Anyone know it? One person. It's where actually where, near where I was born. Uh, great national forest. It's outside the Bay Watershed, unfortunately, but it's, uh, it's there. So that was 2008. But 1928, you know, it's our national forest. So you had a harvest. There's a harvest up there. 
Uh, they came back to do, this is actually called a chemical cut, where they harvest all the big stuff and eventually they come back for the smaller stuff to take the tannins out of it. Um, so you can say it's pretty much knock succession back. Okay, you can see within that 10 years, things grow like crazy. So things re-emerging, they're battling for that light. Okay, thousands of trees per acre, thousands upon thousands of trees per acre. So I want you to, if you can, focus on this tree right here. These two are cherry trees. Okay, all of these are pretty much cherry trees. Competing. You can see within the next 10 years, what starts to happen? They thin out here are those cherry trees again. This is a sugar maple tree. So here's the battle for light. These are the biggest ones that we have right now. Battling for light. Let's see, another 10 years later. What's, what's happening with these trees? These are the exact same age. What's happening between these two trees? Each straighter. Yeah, they're definitely getting straighter. How about comparing to each one? Which one's bigger? Yeah, why do you suppose this one's bigger than that one? Different type. No, they're both black cherry. Both black cherry. Different amount of light. So which one's getting more light? Yeah, so, so if a tree gets more light, they can produce more food, which they can grow bigger. A tree that's stunted, you can walk in your forest and see, you know, small trees like that that are in the understory. It's just because they're not giving light to expand. They'll never grow, unless there's some light that's given to them. These are sugar maple trees, and you can actually see the sugar maples starting to grow in the understory. They tolerate on those gardens. Now, they tolerate a lot of shade, but they grow extremely slow. So watch that one too as we start to go on. You can see, yeah, you can definitely see all the sugar maple now that are growing up. They're just hanging in the understory. You can also see how well, it's starting to get bigger and bigger. This is an alder tree in the back that's obviously getting up and dominating. Yeah, there's that alder tree that broke right there. So this was covering on the uh, crowns here on the right. So it's leaving this one a little bit of more room to grow. You can see the sugar maple aren't getting that much bigger. They grow very slow, very, very slow. And you can see because that alder tree, what's happening to this tree now? Yeah, it's getting much bigger because it has that light. Where's that sugar maple? And you can see someone's caught that side, this tree's side. It's got a little bit bigger. Not that much. And then there's, I guess you do, I looked for the photo for this year, but I don't think it's out yet. So uh, you can see. What do you notice the difference between this tree? Or this this picture. What's present in this picture? It's not here. Grasses. Yeah, this is all that microsthesia. Mm -hmm. Or my uh, yeah. So microsthesia, anyone knows? Uh, Japanese stilt grass, anyone have that? You probably it's all over here for sure. It. I know it's it's an annual plant. It's once it's been probably it's really hard to get rid of. Um, but yeah, it's an annual. Right now they're releasing seeds, so it's almost too much. The seed survives in the soil for about seven years. So, yeah, unfortunately, between those 10 years, microsthesium has got to this remote place of uh, how we do national forest. Okay, that's all I had on that before I kind of got into the, to the, a little bit of some of the programs that we have here in Maryland. Does anyone have any questions on ecology? So, can I ask you a local question? You can ask me. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have a talk next month, I hear, about the massive septic system. Mm -hmm. We have these special kinds of septic things, but when they put those things in, uh, many people didn't take care of them. And down where I live on Cattle Creek, we have phytophthora fungus everywhere, which when I looked it up, it was killing my white oaks. I'm like, what is going on? And I had an arborist come out. These huge cankers that smell like acetic acid, like vinegar, in, in May. Uh -huh. And I finally had to like kick him in the rear to send the sample off to their labs, and it came back phytophthora fungus. And I looked it up, and it said, "Well, this is a fungus that we see in third world countries where there is no proper sewage." Oh, oh God! God. <laughs> That's the wow! I might not know anything about that. <laughs> 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 he might have his face. <laughs> So we then had a microburst come through and take up seven tulip poplars, root mat, and everything. And there was phytophthora fungus everywhere there, about an acre and a half, speaking of, you know. Wow. So $30,000 to take all those trees out, take the mats out, 
backfill with healthy soil. And so this was a major revelation. So when people see their trees beginning to have these black spots on them, I mean, you know, and they're very expensive drip that you can get, but you've got to get it early enough or else the tree is going to die. So, yeah. so I, I, I worry about these human factors that are not just caused by humans putting in septic systems in the peninsula, but things like that are washing down from the Conaligo Dam and those kinds of things that are affecting our, um, our forests. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a great point. That's, that's tragic. When you were talking about fires, I thought you were talking about like edible mushrooms. Well, <laughs> These are not ones you want to eat. No, and I mean, there were big, black, ugly mushrooms, wow. and when the arborist saw it, he's like, oh my god. This is, so I, I just I think that there are more things here on the Mayo Peninsula that are, um, you know, they want us to plant trees, but in what? In what? Was that the county arborist who came, or the oh, no, got private? A private, private, certified arborist too. You've never heard about this phytophthora fungus? I mean, it, sounds like, mm -hmm. it sounds like a question we need to ask next month to the folks who are in charge of the septic <laughs> system was that, in the Mayo. Was that yeah. human or animals? Oh, no, it's human it. from, the, from the leaking EPA experiment to put septic systems in the Mayo Peninsula to prevent sewage from going out into the water. So. My so is one that, time could have been a feedlot or something like that. No, no. So is that in the, the I guess, I don't know, what are they called, grinder tanks, the great big? Yeah, they're technically not grinder tanks, but they are the big, what I call the chemistry beaker. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. A big, are you familiar with those here on the Oh, oh so. well, we all oh, have to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there are, there are, there are probably, the beaker, the lower part of the beaker is probably about eight feet high. And then there's probably about a 16-foot uh, um, neck, and that's where the sewage goes in, and then the liquids are pumped out to the you know, septic station, and then periodically they come and clean out the um, um, Solid. the solids. But if your pipes are going to that and they're broken, you will it's have leaching in out into the and so the county periodically comes and does what they call a smoke test, where they will put theater smoke in the beaker part mm -hmm. and blow it back. And in our case, <laughs> it came up everywhere. It came up everywhere around the house. <laughs> wow. And it went back into the house and blew <laughs> the water out of the toilet on the oh second floor. <laughs> And we had just moved there. And then I got a nasty letter from the county saying, um, hey, we told you you should take care of this. Well, the people who bought the house from never told us about any of that. But, but I mean, I, I think that these are the kinds of things that, you know, so over time it killed our over 100-year-old white oak trees yeah. that, you know, and I, I'm like crying. I'm, I'm, I'm literally yeah, crying as they're, they're taking them down. Yeah, I, I don't know what to say. I know they do use they do use tree plantings to, to remove toxins from soils, from brown fields and things like that. So, so hybrid poplar, I mean that's a that's a remedy for is it? toxic soils, yeah. So, and, and what kind of poplar do you use? Hybrid poplar. So okay. they're they're uh, and there's probably many more. I don't know much about planting on brown fields, but I do know high like you, uh, University of Maryland Extension did, did some research on if you want to using hybrid poplar because it grows extremely fast. Pulls the toxins in it and, and then cut and dispose of the trees. Oh, okay. Over, so over periods of time. I so see. it's okay. purifying the soil. Okay, all right. That's good to know, though. I mean, that's. And that's different from a tulip poplar. Yeah, no, yeah. So a tulip poplar technically isn't a poplar tree. So okay. um, these are just your regular poplars, like an aspen, cotton. These are all poplars. Um, this is a hybrid poplar. A tulip poplar is just misnamed as a poplar. It's not really a poplar tree. Because of the flower. Well, I am going to break this this next part, and I don't know how relevant it could be, but I am going to talk a little bit about force in general, and you know, the topic was your woods and your wallets. I'm going to talk about economic economic opportunities in your forest. So, 
And he talked about that. But let's just say our forest, we had forest at one time, but as humans came in this era, we used it as a resource. So you know, this is actually in Maryland. Is that Western Maryland? Uh, this actually is in Southern Maryland. This, this is uh, red cedar, so they're making cedar shingles from that, oh, yeah. which is kind of wild. Just do imagine cedar trees being that big, so they, they obviously didn't get topped on that. They were pretty old. Yeah, they were. Uh, being Southern man, you probably know what that is. It was used for a lot of our wood. And what's in this room? <laughs> Your hogs' heads, this tobacco. So that was used a lot. Uh, this is out in Western Maryland as well. So most of our forests were cleared for agriculture. So uh, a lot of that land was just cleared, burned, just. Uh, so our forests had been reduced a lot. Most of our forests were cleared multiple times. So we don't, in Maryland, have any virgin timber. So pretty much all our forests have been cut and grown back, cut again. Uh, we have old growth in Maryland. We have a lot of, well, not a lot of it, but we have it, and most counties have patches here and there of old growth, which just means it's about 150 years ago. Uh, there's multi-aged trees in it. There's a lot of definition on that. But we don't have any virgin timber anymore. So it was cut. Uh, actually, the forest industry was very important, still is very important. Uh, these are actually oyster by boats. In the off season, we'd be carrying lumber back and forth across the bay. Uh, this is a, once we had trains, we can go deeper and deeper into Maryland's forest. This is out in Allegheny County. Those are all loaded with uh, trees. Um, this is in Curtis Bay. This is all hemlock from Maryland, to, actually in Pennsylvania. As well. It's all hemlock boards that go out down to Curtis Bay, getting ready to ship out. Uh, so we can have a use. This one, I always put people on that. Anyone know what use of that? That's Baltimore County. This is probably early on the huge use of our forests. You know what they're making here? This is actually charcoal. So if you, uh, actually, the Maryland legislature gave anyone 100 acres of forest. Look how cool that would be. All they had to do was produce an iron furnace on that 100 acres. So to produce charcoal, which is a steady burning heat, heat you couldn't use wood because you did flash and all that. You got a steady heat, so you build charcoal. I mean, you take the trees, you bury it, light it on fire, you reduce the oxygen, and then you create charcoal. So we use a lot of our forest land for charcoal in the industrial revolution. So like I said before, 95% forested, dropped down into the 30s, and then started to rebound on those abandoned uh, farm fields as kind of the industrial revolution started. People are leaving unproductive agricultural fields, moving into the cities, working in industry. And then in about the 80s, uh, we started to lose force again, rapidly. So this was more towards development, as more and more people moved out of the cities, uh, kind of on those lands, and that still happens today. Maryland, it is small, it is a great place to live, a lot of people still moving in. So we've consistently lost force every decade. So we're, we're continuing to lose force at a pretty rapid rate. Uh, but forest cover, it's still the dominant cover of land's about 39%. You can see it's in uh, certain areas where we have most of our forests, but it's in every county. We have forests. We have forest service in every county. So it is still important. Um, and the thing about our forests and really the whole East Coast, and this is something that a lot of people don't think about, is most of our forests in the East are privately owned. Okay, in the Bay of Watershed, it's about 80%. So when you're driving and you're seeing these large tracts of forest, most people think, ah, oh, it's probably a park or something like that, or the state owns it, or the federal government owns it. And that's not true. Most of our forest is privately owned by private landowners. If you go out west, then you have these large tracts of federal and state lands where about half of the forests out there are publicly owned. So it's a little bit different in the east. And the reason I, I say that is, is it does have some ramifications that most of our forests, so this is how they're broken down, this is the Bay Watershed, the forest of the size of these forests that we have right now. So this is the breakdown of the forest size, 1 to 9 acres, 1049. So you can see it as it goes down this way. You can see a lot of our forests are still in blocks of 100 acres to 500 acres. So a lot of our private forests are still that, but they're owned by very few people. You can see a majority, overwhelmingly majority of our forests are owned in smaller and smaller blocks. And really, as that happens, people are buying more property uh, and they're parcelizing them up. But essentially, if you think about a family, okay, they have one forest block, they hand it off to their children, the three children, it's divided three ways, you've just parcelized that. So 
The problem, we'll go with it, some of the issues are. So parcelization is dividing it. It's when it's fragmented, which becomes more difficult. And that's, you know, you have one parcel, so you start to develop this part, and this part, and this part. It makes it kind of difficult. So the problems with fragmentation is, well, there's many things. One, it isolates habitats. So if you think about you having one forest block here, well, as you start to parcelize them, habitats become isolated. Now, maybe not to your deer or your to run everywhere, but think if you're a box turtle or something, you had this whole forest, you had a lot of mates, and now you have a smaller forest you live in, where you're not going to be crossing that open field. So it limits your gene pool. It increases your edge. This is probably the big one, I think, in this area, the, the problem. So an edge of a forest is just the edge, okay? It's this edge of the forest. By making our forests smaller, we're increasing the edge. That makes sense? If you imagine this whole forest here, there's that circumference, so there's an edge. As you make smaller ones, now you're adding all this new edge to it. So the reason the edge is really tough is it invites invasive plants. Because invasive plants tend to prefer the edge. If you have a big forest, where you're going to find most of your invasives are right in the first you know, 25 yards of that forest. Because there's enough light there. They dominate that area. They can succeed there. As you walk deep into a forest, you see less and less invasive plants. So increasing the edge of something just invites more invasive plants. Uh, it increases the number of forest landowners, which just means there's more people out there that might need help or resources to take care of the forest. And it really decreases the opportunity to do anything on your land. So if I have 50 acres, I can do a lot with my land. I could, I could do a timber harvest. So I can make money on that and reinvest it back in my forest and do, say, clear invasive plants with some of that money. When you start to get smaller and smaller forests, you decrease your opportunity to do anything in that forest. So that, you know, five acres is great, but if you wanted to do a thinning, let's say your forest is overcrowded, you're not going to find anyone to come in to do a thinning on five acres. It's just not economically viable for a logger to come in to do that. So decreasing opportunity uh, it, it's pretty difficult. So we have other things that are challenging the health of our forests, like invasive plants. Are you guys familiar with invasive plants? Does anyone have any other problems? Yeah. <laughs> I discovered they come in many forms, and they're getting new ones every single day, it seems like. So this is like that microsthesium uh, grass. This is actually Tapsco Park. And you can see here, you might look at this in the park and say, oh, how beautiful. But look at that carpet there. But where's your next forest? There isn't a next forest, because it's just microsthesium. Nothing's growing up to replace these trees. Uh, this is Japanese barberry, which is a landscaping plant. It's brought in as a landscaping plant. Uh, it, we have an, an American barberry, which is very similar, but this one has dominated everything. And it'll dominate the understory, and they're actually making a connection with the abundance of this plant with the abundance of people being infected with Lyme disease. Wow. Because it provides such a great habitat for the white-footed mouse, which is a host to the ticks, uh, that, uh, you know, it's kind of their first blood meal, which there, there was a study in Connecticut where they found a lot of that Lyme disease first, of the increased amount of this with the increased amount of people being infected. So, um, anyone know this one? Beautiful tree, tree, of heaven. tree of heaven. Yeah, or stinking sumac or whatever. So, uh, yeah, this is the common form of trees. There's a lot of invasive trees out there. White mulberry, mimosa tree, uh, Norway maple. So, this one is very prolific. Um, this one grows up by its roots. Does anyone have this on their property? Anyone ever try to cut one of these down? You do, it just pisses it off because they just keep growing up through its roots. Right. And actually, it goes into panic mode. So when you do cut it, it wants to survive, so its roots will start putting up shoots. You can constantly mow those, but it's going to keep doing it until it runs out of carbohydrates. So this is the one that you've got to just be gentle with, figure out. Uh, there's ways of killing it, but cutting it down without an herbicide is not... Not a good idea. And then this one. This is actually Maryland. This is kudzu. Oh, this is a barn in Maryland. That's a barn. Yeah, we had a, we had, this is in Kent County, here in Morton. We had a, a seven acre tree planting. I was driving soon. Of course, I'm driving down the country road. I looked over and I saw it. I slammed on the brakes. They had a big silo that was covered with it as well. I mean, it was obviously abandoned, but yeah, kudzu actually is a problem. We're doing a tree planting in Anne Arundel County here next year, but right now, uh, the person has five acres of cuts that they're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. any kind of um, 
Invasive insects are another thing that are challenging the health of our forests, which, you know, 100 years ago, we didn't have this. Um, including this one, this is the emerald ash borer. This one's pretty much decimating any ash tree that we have. So green ash and white ash are the dominant trees we have here. A lot of street trees were green ash and white ash because they tolerate some rough conditions. So, and they're beautiful trees, very hardy wood, um, but they attack them. So Maryland's pretty much given up hope, I think, on any kind of ash survival. I remember when it came in. Anyone know what county it came into? Prince George's. No, it actually came into Prince George's. I used to work on a farm in Prince George's County. It came in to a nursery from a nursery stock that came from Michigan that started in Tennessee. So they shipped around these plants from all this area, came into Prince George's County, they discovered it. They immediately tried to quarantine Prince George's County. No ash trees. In the farm that I worked at, if we had ash trees, we were growing them. So we could, they couldn't leave the county. And they, they tried to do these circles where they're eliminating all the ash trees and they get bigger circles and eliminate all those ash trees. But now it's everywhere. It's actually across the bridge now. It's on the eastern shore, which used to be just the western shore. Um, we have gypsy moth, which we've had for a long time. Uh, this one's called walnut twig beetle. Uh, it goes after black walnut, but it delivers a fungus. It's not that this that it's the problem. It delivers a fungus uh, called thousand cankers disease. Uh, but this one moves very slow. It's in Cecil County right now. It's in Virginia. It moves very slow, but they're concerned about this one. Uh, this is, you want to know this one? This one's the most devastating. I'm in Pennsylvania, and our state tree is the hemlock. Yeah, it's a lovely tree. Uh, this is uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. So it attacks these old stately hemlock trees. Really, they're, they're, these are insects, and they really suck the sap out of these trees. So there's not much. I mean, you can treat individual trees, but forests, like if you go out to Western Maryland, uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're being devastated out there. Well. So how do you spell that name? Hemlock what? Woolly, like a woolly, W H O L L Y, like it's all covered in wool. Yeah. And adelgid. A D. <laughs> yeah. Any spelling I'm going to defer, it's a, Laura? It's Wooly Adelgid, A D, um, I can't say it out loud, A D E L G I D. Just the way it's spelled. Yeah. I mean, it's now, I've seen them, it's in Anne Arundel County, so yeah, I've seen it on that much. Uh, there's a new one, it's called Lanternfly. This one, it's, it's not in Maryland yet. But it, I don't want to be depressing, but it could be worse than a lot of trees. It's in, uh, it's in Pennsylvania right now, it's in southeast Pennsylvania. Probably in Jersey. Um, and then deer are actually changing kind of the landscape. Does anyone have a problem with deer down there? Yeah. <laughs> Everywhere. Yeah, so deer, great. They naturally should be here, uh, but they, we're at populations that can't be sustained. You can kind of see what they do to a forest. And your landscaping plants. Uh, they just really devastate everything. So you can see it's kind of that browse line they have here. Uh, this is a harvest that was done. This is a deer fence. And you can see this area was fenced out. This area wasn't. See the difference. These are all trees growing back. Nothing's growing back here. There's that browse line here. We just have an overpopulation in certain areas of deer um, for this area. They're generous. They love you know landscaping plants, a little bit of forest. They do this. Unfortunately, this still happens as well. High grade harvesting. And I would say just there's a story on here uh, by a forester who actually used to live in Anne Arundel, Brian Knox. It's in the back, but at some point, read that story on what about high grade harvesting. Unfortunately, this still happens. Um, you know, to say a, a logger comes up, knocks on your door, and says, uh, "You know, can I just walk in your woods and see if there's anything great back there?" He says, "Sure." They come back and say, "All right, that's, I'm going to give you sixty thousand dollars. I'm going to leave you a forest. I'm just going to take some of your trees." And you're like, "Great." They go back, harvest, looks great, you still have a forest. What just happened? What trees did they just take off your property? You think? If you left it up to the logger to choose your trees, or the forester to choose the trees they wanted, they're going to take your highest value trees out of your forest. Your oaks are essentially gone. The straightest, the biggest oaks, the one with the biggest crown that have dominated, the one that spreads the most acorns, those are the ones that are going. So it's really taking the highest value out of your forest. So essentially people are losing the value of their forest in one particular time. Um, so unfortunately, high grading still goes on. There's ways of getting around it. I'll talk about it a little bit, even though it may not apply to you, but using foresters. Uh, but 
The reason we do this, the reason that I have a job, is because landowners really are the solution to the Bay's woes. It's really private landowners, because private land is providing the public good. I do not own a forest. I, didn't, I have two trees in my property. Uh, they provide a little bit of benefits. But people's private lands are providing me clean air, and clean water, wildlife. Is providing it. So we work with landowners to help them take care of their forests, to connect them to resources, to be able to do that. Um, I'll kind of I'll fly through this with time. This is kind of the benefits of owning woods. Just uh, so there, because of that, there are economic incentives for actually owning forests. There's tax programs. I'm going to kind of go over two. It may not apply to you, but if you have some with woods. You can tell them because they don't get used. Step one, I always say, if you do have any woods, is just get out and enjoy them. Okay, most people, they might like their woods. Some people never get out into them. And this is, I always use this quote. Uh, a friend of mine who worked up in Baltimore County talked to this woman. She had 20 acres of woods in Baltimore County. Asked her what she wanted to do with them. He's a woods enthusiast. And she that came with the house. Do you think she's connected with her woods? Do you think she cares if the woods are back there? <laughs> Not at all. This is another property we're working with in, in Baltimore. This is someone who wasn't connected. And she later did, but we're going through this. It's tough to see, but this tree is five feet in diameter. It's an oak tree. It's five feet in diameter. It was maybe 150 yards from this woman's house. She had no idea it was on. There was a path going by this tree that someone else was using. So I always say, get out and enjoy. Your, if you have trees, get out and enjoy. Um, and then also have a plan for them. A plan begins with a, kind of the end in mind. We're very, very lucky uh, in Maryland that in order to be a forester, to call yourself a forester, you had to have a forestry license. You have to be licensed to be a forester. Meaning, you've had to have gone to a four-year university and study forestry. Doesn't mean you're a great forester, it just means you went through, you got your license. Places like Virginia and Pennsylvania, anybody can call themselves a forester. There's no licensing for foresters. Anyone can say, yeah, I'm a forester, and then try to offer you assistance. You have to be licensed in Maryland, which means you have to keep your license up, go to get some edu uh, continue education. In Maryland, we have many types of foresters. We have public foresters. They work for Maryland Forest Service. Uh, every county has a forester. Does anybody know Anne Arundel County's forester? Justin Arsenault. Very good guy. Really nice guy. I think their office is up in Pasadena. Um, but every county has a forester assigned. They work for the public. They work for private landowners. Um, they're employed by the state. They can give you advice on your forest. They can come out and talk to you about your forest. They can help you write a forest stewardship plan. Uh, they do charge a nominal fee for the plans, and we'll go to what those are. Um, but they can't be involved in any kind of a tree harvest. And the reason being, they're public foresters. That's a private transaction between a landowner and a forest product company. They can't be taking one side or the other. But they can give you advice on it. We also have consulting foresters uh, in Maryland. They're private contractors. Uh, they work for whoever hires them, like you know, a doctor, a lawyer. Uh, they can develop a stewardship plan for you. They can help you implement your plans. Uh, they can appraise timber on your land. And they can be your agent uh, for anything. So it could be your agent hiring contractors to come to deal with invasive plants, to do a thinning, or to do a timber sale. They work for you. So they work with the loggers and uh, uh, natural resource contractors. Uh, we also have industrial foresters. And so they work for the industry. So people like, who work for a sawmill. Uh, Johnson Lumber over on Eastern Shore. They have their own foresters who go out and try to buy uh, um, timber. Gladfelder Pulp Mill. They have their own foresters. They're working with landowners, you know, to offer them a price for their uh, for their timber. They work for University of Maryland Extension. We have two of them uh, in the state. Uh, one is located over on the Eastern Shore. Agnes, I just met her. She's brand new. I can't remember her last name. Uh, and then Jonathan Case, who's been here forever, and he's out in Keysville. So they offer programs, they have a great website, a lot of information <laughs> on that. Um, they, they do a really nice job. They essentially take research and bring it down to the public to make it uh, uh, comprehensible. 
Uh, so let's go over quickly a stewardship plan. Uh, we'll kind of fly through that. But this is the key to conservation right here. Giving an easement, this is the key to conservation programs. It's the key to easements. I think it's the key to understanding your forest as well. Unfortunately, you need five acres of forest to get one of these. Uh, but a forest stewardship plan, you need five contiguous acres. There's cost share to, have, to pay for all this stuff. Um, and what it is, this is what's great about it. So this is the farm I used to work on in, in Prince George's County at 90 acres of forest. But the farmer picked his goals for his property. It's up to the forester to be able to match the goals with what that forest can provide. These guys are thinking these things are so crucial. Practice will balance the needs of the landowner and the needs of the forest. So the farmer wanted to do a harvest timber. He wanted to leave some so he can harvest again in another 15 years. He wanted to protect all the soil and the water that was on, the, on the, uh, within the uh, forest out there. This is a typical farm woodland. So pretty much the woods are left anywhere you couldn't farm. Sort of or really anywhere in Maryland. So it's 90 acres total. Uh, but you can see on here just how you can see your forest differently. So this is one section here. This is about 25 acres right here. So you have a one, two, and a three. Why do you suppose the forester looked at this as one, two, and three? Why, why do you suppose there are different numbers on that? We'll take a guess. Age. Yeah, it could be age. That just means forest one in this section looks drastically different than this. It's not all just one forest in the back. There's different things you can do with it to match your goals. Look at one. One has a stream right here. So the farmer is concerned about protecting water quality. So he's going to think about this differently than this and this. And that's kind of true. And I don't expect to do this. But this is that stand one right here. So what a forester would do would come on your property. They walk out in your woods. They measure trees. They identify the species. They look at the soils. Uh, they look at pretty much everything. Um, and they come up with some recommendations based on your goals. So this one had a lot of tulip poplar, sweet gum, and sycamore. Uh, it was overstocked. I mean, there's a lot of trees there. Um, growth potential was really excellent. But the farmer wanted to protect the, the water there. There were steep slopes. So he said, just manage it. Don't do anything here. Manage it. Keep these trees here. Deal with the invasives. And here are two programs that will help you pay for it. The Woodland Incentive Program, and then EQIP, which was with uh, NRCS or the federal government, the farm programs. So look at two. So you look at two. Tumble poplar, red oak, white oak. So these are three high value trees. Growth potential, excellent. Overstocked, you need to thin those out anyways. So he's saying if you're going to do a harvest, do it at number two. So that makes sense. If looking at a forest, he's not getting high grade because he knows where he can harvest his trees and where he should leave it alone for the health of his forest. Now, but also 50 years from now. Okay. So we're very, very lucky also in Maryland that landowners have a cost share program available for their wood lots. No other state I know of in the East has a program through the state that will help landowners take care of their land. We do in Maryland. We also have two federal programs. And these are the kind of things that are eligible to be paid for. Forest management plans, invasive plant control, tree planting, buffer work, habitat management, uh, forest stand improvement. So they're all things within your forest that you can bring up the help on it that can be paid for. Um, does anyone have any questions on that? I, I just I might go through the forest products industry if no one has enough land. To... I have a question. Sure. Um, so like in Anne Arundel County, we've got lots of woodlands that are owned in. They're, they're public land owned by the county. I'm thinking yep. about the parks on the Mayo Peninsula. Is there any requirement that those be under a forest management plan? Are those actively managed woodlands, or are they just... Owned by land? the county? Yeah. I'm going to say most of the county properties are not managed at all, wow. which is it's a tragedy. Baltimore County, and the reason I had that guy from Baltimore, Baltimore County is actually leading the way, and hopefully that catches on in Anne Arundel. In Baltimore County, they're taking their public land, they're looking at health issues, and they're managing. And, and the reason Don Allen, who's since retired, unfortunately, he worked for their environmental protection. Anyone know Oregon Ridge up in Baltimore County? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great park. Anyone been there? Mm -hmm. Anyone notice when you walk there, there's one area that was just cleared away. So about 10 years ago, and I was more than that, I've been here 10 years. 
So it's probably about 15 years ago. This one area of Oregon Ridge Park was so dense with trees, big, huge oak trees, and the county did nothing for it. It's like there's a lot of oak trees. Gypsy moth came through at that time. It wiped out. It, there must have been 40 acres of trees. Killed every tree there. So they had a lot of dead trees there, and they went through and they did a salvage cut. They cut everything down to kind of clear it out, and they started it again. But it got that guy thinking, well, this is our public lands, and you know, there were other places in the park that weren't devastated. They were fine. It was just that one particular area. He wondered why. So he called in a forester, and the forester said there were way too many trees there. So what happens when trees compete, when anybody competes, everybody kind of loses. So trees compete, and they're using their resources, and so they're kind of all weakened. Anytime you have a population that's too big. Well, Gypsy Moth took advantage of that, and that's the stand they hit first. Because in all trees, they have defense mechanisms against herbivory. So against insects, they're fighting it as the insects are eating them. So they're releasing toxins. But there was so much that these trees couldn't put the defense mechanism enough. So he was like, we got to do something about this because we have a lot of parks that this is happening through. And then he went through and he got stewardship plans for all of our parks. You know, they didn't do commercial timber harvest, but they did thinnings. So they thinned out all of their, a lot of their forests to make them healthier. And they were fortunate that they had a Gladfelder Paper Company who's really close by, and glad a paper company, a mill, they want your junky trees. They want the small trees, because you can't make pulp out of the big stuff. They want the small stuff. So they're thinning it out. It's great for them, but it's also good for the forest. So, you know, it's been a long time. I don't know of any, many other counties that are doing that, but it can be done. Public lands can be managed for forest health. So Oregon Ridge, they've actually done thinnings up there to go back through. They have a nice forest. No, I was just going to say, like, from my perspective, that's a concern for me for the peninsula because so much of our remaining large forest tracts are owned by the county. Oh, they are. And so if something were to happen, that... Do you, you know, know Do you know if they're, they... I could buy them. You talked to Bob. Has there been serious plans on any of that? I'm back. I think we're identifying a need, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is the thing. Is to at least get a stewardship plan. A stewardship plan would let you know what's going on in your forest. And I think that is, it is possible. There's a county employee that. The county employee have two licensed foresters. Can I ask you, are you saying it would be net zero cost to the county no, 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 to go on some of these plans and adopt a stewardship yeah, yeah. plan? Yeah. Well, the county, like, and I don't want to bring him in there, but there's two licensed foresters in the county. I don't know if their workload's overwhelming right now. Both of them can write stewardship plans. <laughs> I'm going to yell at me. But, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, but no, technically, but they can write a stewardship them. plan to implement them. That's the problem, is to implement them is the tougher. It takes someone, that has to be a priority for a county to implement the plan. So there's no cost share money out there for implementation. It's all for development of the plan. Well, within the county, so the county wouldn't be a bit. They wouldn't be eligible for state cost share, uh, and they wouldn't be eligible for federal cost share. It would have to be something in there. But Don Allen was able to do it in Baltimore because, and they were able to make money on it because one of the big problems with a lot of forests is being overstocked. So thinning out a forest can make you some money. It's not as much money as, I say, a timber harvest would do, but what Don was able to do with that money is put it back into these forests for things like invasive plant control or tree planting and stuff that he was doing. So it's a way of getting some income that can come back in the forest. The political will to do that or to make that a priority <laughs> is not huge. There's a reason Don Allen's retired right now. It's because of politics and people putting the, the stop on some of the stuff that he was doing. It's, it was tragic because he was really setting the way on public lands for local governments to be able to do this stuff on public lands. This doesn't happen a lot. Just because I'm not super familiar, what's the time burden to create a plan like this and implement it? When you start to start to finish, how long does it take? Uh, to, to actually write the plan or to... To come take a look at the, let's say it's a county... Yes. Yeah. To have the county uh, forester come out, take a look at it, make an evaluation, write a plan, and and then start it. If, if, if the forester, let's say it's a couple hundred acres, say if the forester, if that was the only thing they had to do, like you're going to go do that, right. it, it could take a few days to take the data on it. 
So they're going around, they set the plots, they take the data, go back, you analyze the data, so you're putting that information in. And to write the plan can take a few more days to actually write the plan. So you can get your recommendations based on that stuff. It, the most of the time is going out and you're literally measuring the force. You're setting up your plots, you're looking for those stands, one, two, three, what you can do in it. So um, now if you add the politics in there of what you're allowed to do, I bet you if the county force, if you gave them the option, like a Bud Reeves saying, you can do what you want to make this healthy, and that's the only thing you have to do right now, I think that it'd be awesome. I think you could do a lot of cool stuff on some of these lands. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Can I ask one more? Yeah, yeah. sure. You said it, um, in Baltimore County they were actually making money on it. What's the startup cost? What's the initial kind of, say, this couple hundred acres? What are you putting in before you get anything out? Because if you're going to, in a pol in a political sense, right, the first question is going to be how much does it cost? So I'm curious. <laughs> In, in that case, it costs nothing, nothing to the county. Okay. Well, the, the, I, I take that back. It, it would take Don, Don Allen's time to initiate everything, to get the forester online, and the politics of getting, let's say, Gladfelder, they'd have to go through a contract, and I'm sure the contract for Baltimore County has to go through about a million yeah, yeah. people. For sure. But the idea, like, if you were a landowner to do that, it doesn't cost you, it wouldn't cost you anything. Because a lot of the costs, let's say on a timber harvest, it's really just taken out of the overall cost. So to get it started, right. a landowner doesn't have to do anything. Even if a landowner hires their own consultant forester to work with the forester of the forest products company, it doesn't cost anything. You're not paying the forester anything. You do come up with an agreement with your forester, they're going to get a percentage of the harvest. Um, so it doesn't really cost anything. Yep. But with the county, I think it would be... So do you have experience with uh, one of the things that we have to be very aware of down here, which is the critical area and the bunker area? Yes. Can you talk about a Sure. Um, I do have a slide, but critical area, so it's pretty stringent. Uh, you can harvest timber in the critical area. You just need a plan to do any activities in the critical area that goes through the county. So, any kind of disturbance within a thousand feet from that tidal line. So, technically, if you have a stewardship plan, you can do a harvest. I, mean, I think there is a buffer area where you can't do anything. It's a hundred feet. Yeah. But within that thousand, the rest of it, you can do it as long as you're following a stewardship plan written by a licensed forester. Now, it may take longer. County would have to review it. There might be a couple other things that, that go on. But technically, you can do forestry in that critical area. Any other questions? I don't know what people want to hear. A lot of this stuff does pertain to harvest with people with larger acres. I don't have to go into that if it doesn't pertain to anyone. Can, but can you back up like two or three slides where you talk you were flip not that one? Yeah, that one. Because those are the Yeah, so this one you, you do need a stewardship plan. All these you need to that's your access to get into these things. The Maryland program is pretty much just say all right, I have this forest, I have a stewardship plan that says I have to get rid of these invasive plants or I want to get rid of all this kudzu. As long as you have a stewardship plan, they'll cover 65% of that cost. All it is, it's usually a reimbursable thing, so you can even do the work yourself. And, and here's the receipts for the herbicide or that, and they'll pay you 65%. Or you hire a contractor to do it. They just pay you 65%. It's very easy to do it. These ones, there's a lot of money. This one, don't worry about It's more about uh, planting trees. But this one... It's a lot of money in it. A lot of money. Never gets used because there's so many bells and whistles and hoops and things you have to go through uh, to get it. But it doesn't get used as much. A lot of people turn it away. But there's real. There's a lot of funds in this because it's a federal program. And Maryland leaves money every year on the table that never gets used in forestry dollars. So, but they're good programs. They just you have to be willing to go through the steps of that. Um. Do RCS have any programs to identify um, forest interior dwelling species or, you know, help local people do that? There is, I don't know if NRCS would do that. If you use Fish and Wildlife, the Chesapeake office here, which is right here, they, they would have someone who would probably be able to do that. If it's, you know, like Rich Mason. I don't yeah, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, they do, DNR would have someone in Wildlife and Heritage would be able to do that as well. So, yeah, they all have biologists who probably do that. Yeah. 
probably would. And they would spend the time in the forest to, to produce a, a study. I mean, that's dangerous. that I, I don't know on that, but it's, right, right. Um, that I don't know. I, I know they do study. I know they do work on private lands. Okay. But I, I'm sure. Now you said fish and wildlife and DNR. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife. I know they do things like that. I know they do study that. DNR Wildlife and Heritage. They do it. Like when you get a stewardship plan, the forester actually is contacting wildlife and heritage to see if there's any threatened or endangered species that they need to be concerned with. All that's written into your plan as well. So they kind of know, and they'll show you where that kind of stuff is. So you might have something really cool in your property. And all that information, DNR probably has an idea. And this is all your information. They don't share it publicly. Yeah, they do share it publicly. So, what database are they using to find out what's on those tracts of land? I don't know. They have it. Huh. So, you need a forester to get the answer out of DNR? Oh, no, no, no. no on that, I, I think DNR, I, I'm just saying with, they're not going to share your information with somebody else. Oh, I didn't necessarily mean private. Yeah. Okay. Not good. All right. Any other questions about that? I do. If you're interested in a harvest, um, and stuff like that, I'd be happy to talk with you later on. But there's no sense in going through the motions on that. Um, I, I will go through that tax book. How about I end it on that tax book? Because that's pretty unique, too. Um, by the way, these are the three most valuable trees in this part of Maryland. So if you have those, if you uh, economically, anyone knows what those are? I know. Tula poplar. Tula poplar, yeah. White oak. White oak. Okay. And northern red oak. So those are the those are the big money. Oaks in general are uh, the most valuable. Red oaks are the most valuable. Uh, white oaks are pretty good, and tulip poplar. That's what grows really well around here. They're the most valuable. But you said tulip poplar wasn't really a poplar. Yeah, no, it's not a poplar. It's so what is it? It's yeah. liliodendron uh, tulipifera. So it's the only one in its own. It's the only genus. I think it's the only one in its own family as well. But is that the one that gets the bad rap for being hollow and falling over? It does. It's very shallow rooted. Yes. Okay. Fast growing okay. tree. Uh, they grow very, very fast. Lumber side, but beautiful tree. It's good for wildlife. But they do. They do fall over. They do get heart rot as well. They're good for pollinators. They're, yeah, great for pollinators. This big flower. It's a great tree. They uh, made Maryland famous <laughs> yeah. because they used them for mass for trees. So when they came here for the colonies, they saw all these huge right. <laughs> tulip poppers, and there's no branches all the way up. To yeah, they the yeah they're, they're essentially the redwood of the east because they grow nice and straight, really big stems. So you can see them a mile away too. They're, they're great tree. Um, so I'll just kind of end on this. We do have tax programs for forests, which are pretty cool. You do need five acres to do this, but what it does is it reduces the assessed value of that forest. So your taxes go down. It, it's kind of the example I, I give. So the first one's called the Forest Conservation and Management Agreement, or FCMA. Uh, this was a law passed by the state legislature. And the reason it came by was we were losing so much forest so fast that the legislature came up with a law to try to help landowners hold on to their land by reducing their taxes. Um, so what it does is it reduces the assessed value to $125 per acre. By law, can't change unless the legislature changes that. You mean it takes 125 off, or just no, no, no. So you're assessed it like yeah. So what? So I'll give you that example. Let's say in a fast-growing county, let's say per acre your land is assessed, the market value is assessed at five thousand dollars per acre on that. So typically, uh, your tax bill just on that, say 25 acres of forest land, would be 1,250 a year. This is kind of general. Different counties are slightly higher, slightly lower. Uh, just a general figure on this. And ruling that same property into this tax program, just that forest, you, you're frozen at $125 of that assessed value, your total bill would be $31. Wow. So that's huge. And, and it saved a lot of people, especially in those fast growing counties, to be able to hold on. The unfortunate thing is, people don't know about these programs. Yeah. And did this come with smart growth? No, there, this, I can't remember when this came out. It, it was, it's been here a long time. It might have been. I, it might have. So, um, I'm an architect, and when mm -hmm. I have clients who um, do additions and renovations, and they, they decide, you know, or developers, whatever, but clients or whatever, they, you know, they're told by the county, you need to put this amount of your land, I mean, I had one client not far from here, have to put like 17 acres into an easement. Right. Can they claim that 
after? I mean, if you've been kind of forced to put your oh, land yeah. into an easement, do they then now, I should advise them to find out about this? So that yeah, yeah, no, we're about two programs. Yeah, through an FCA, that they are required to preserve that. It's an easement. Yeah. Um, but yeah, through F FCMA, it just reduces your property tax. Absolutely. Right, okay. and it's, uh, in fact, um, there are stipulations. This actually is an easement program. It's a 15 year easement program. It's not permanent. It's 15 years. At the end of 15 years, you can pull out of it. But within that 15 years, if you develop, let's say, five acres of it, you have to pay back taxes on those five acres that you develop. All the way back to the beginning. So it's an easement program. You know, people got stuck in those that didn't want. This is, I think, an easier program. It's just called Woodland Assessment. All you need is a stewardship plan with this. The, uh, the taxes, state tax assessment office say, yep, I got this. Five contiguous acres. The tax rate is slightly higher. The assessed value is 187. This could change. There's no law saying it has to be at 187. Hasn't changed in the 10 years I've been doing this. It's the same thing. Um, same 25 acres, you can see 1250 a year or $48 per year. So this one's great because you can pull out, if you wanted to, you technically could pull out any time. Um, both of these have inspections, which there's some fees on that. You have to have your forester come and do the tax inspections. It's essentially saying, nope, they haven't developed any of this. You're good to go. Every This one I think is every three years. The FCMA is every five years on that. So there are some fees on that. But these are great programs you can get into. Pretty valuable. If you pull out, they have to pay the back taxes. On this one, on the Woodland Assessment, you don't. Wow. And it's not an easement. So it, it's the other one's a 15 year easement. Better rates, but I think most people end up going towards this one. Just because it's easier to get in and out if you need. Well, I don't labor through the rest of it. It has to do with harvest and timber, but it's interesting stuff. Yeah. I say if you're ever in a situation, you're harvesting timber, or you know someone is doing it, tell them to hire their own forester. That avoids the high grading. Someone who's good. So, you just <laughs> hire your own forester. All right. All right. Thank you. That was great. That was really very excellent. A huge amount of information in a short period of time. Uh, maybe it didn't apply to all of us landowners, but it applies to some of our neighbors if it doesn't apply to us. So we should spread the word, and Craig's a resource for us. Um, you passing out your business cards? It's all on It's there. all on there. You secretly put it on. There. Okay, good. <laughs> on the back's our website, and then you can contact me through that. With, uh, okay. My information's yeah. all there. So go out in the woods, use these things. Right, and I do think that... There's some potential for um, the county-owned properties right uh, in the Mayo Peninsula. So you may be hearing from us about those areas. Get some more advice. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So thank you, everybody. I know there's.